who um, um, sends best of greetings to you. You can see him in the photo here, um, but uh, he doesn't speak <laughs> any English. And at the moment he has some COVID or sorry, some health issues with COVID in his family. So um, I, I'm just uh, sending greetings from him. And uh, we are both very thankful for this wonderful um, way of meeting, even though it's, it's a shame that you can't be here and I can't meet you over there. So today I have about 12 slides to you about the work that Snow Change, the organization that I work for, does. And I try to put into the context the significance of uh, indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, and how, how do we move forward in the Arctic that's really being affected by climate change. Before I go any further, I also would like to greet you on behalf of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. We are, we are on the last cusps of releasing a new report that will come out at the end of this month that has been in preparation for over five years. And just in 10 days time, you will see a lot of the latest science, including indigenous knowledge of uh, how, how the um, planet is doing and where should we be heading. So the working group two report will be released. And that's what I'm currently taking a break from to meet all of you um, today. Well, I'll be just very concise and I hope that we'll have questions and uh, discussion um, <clears throat> on the second half of today. But uh, let me just first tell you that Snow Change Cooperative is a Finnish, meaning in Finland, uh, nonprofit or charitable organization. We are also working in the US, mainly in Alaska. That's your northernmost point. And then in Arctic Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Nordic countries, and the Russian North. So in this photo, you can see our teams, which are fishing on the ice. That's Ari and Lauri, two Finnish fishermen. And uh, <clears throat> they are demonstrating a wonderful catch of uh, European Cisco, as this fish would be called in North America. So Snow Change is a network of science and northern communities that are working together to find solutions to these critically important issues that you'll hear about today. And uh, we are <clears throat> also trying to uh, advance the food security and well-being of northern communities. We are all dependent on snow and ice conditions in the north, in the boreal and in the Arctic. And that's why Snow Change was founded as a community network 22 years ago. So we were um, founded in the year 2000. Let me now take you on a uh, very quick geographical tour of Northern Europe. This is a map that shows you a group of languages known as the finno ugric peoples. You will see that Finland is here in the center. I hope people can see this. And then, of course, you would have Sweden, Norway and, and uh, Denmark over here. And then east of us is the large country of Russian Federation. Um, and and uh, these colorful spots on the map will tell you that these are the finno ugric peoples, a non-Indo-European language group. If you think of what's going on, think about English and how English is related to Germanic languages, German, um, <clears throat> Swedish, Norwegian, uh, French, and other languages that, that's spoken in your home area. But here in the north, I'm currently living in this spot here between Finland and Russia in a region called Karelia. And here on the topmost part of the Arctic, you will see the Sami home area, the indigenous Sami peoples. However, the Sami are related to us by language. So the historical context for this part of the world is um, is such that these all of these groups from Western Siberia all the way to Finland and Northern Sweden are belonging into, into a joint set of uh, linguistic um, and related cultures. 
So one of the landscape features of our home is <clears throat> quite large peatland areas, also northern forests. So in this slide, you can see the landscape of how a healthy and uh, well-functioning um, peatland looks like. Why would I start with peatlands in the context of Ar Arctic climate change? About five years ago, snow change because we were growing increasingly concerned about the northern climate change, we started to work on, on a program called Landscape Rewilding Program, and we uh, tried to focus especially on the northern peatlands. Why would we do that? What's the context? Well, in short, uh, I can try to summarize that one third of world's soil-based remaining carbon stocks are in the uh, boreal and in the arctic peatlands and uh, forest ecosystems. So let me try to offer it in a, as clear as I can. Also in northern Canada and Alaska, there are still huge quantities of carbon stocks on the ground where they should be, of course, uh, staying. Additionally, these peatlands are carbon sinks. They are like the lungs of the world. Many of you may think of the um, Amazonia, or um, I know that your home area is around the Great Lakes of the US. Many of the catchment areas or the basins of the Great Lakes are also either former or present peatland ecosystems and boreal forests. And when you think of the, these peatlands, think about yourself breathing in and out. And when these peatlands are drawing breath or breathing in, they are drawing down carbon dioxide, a very potent greenhouse gas. So what I'm um, trying to tell you is that the logic of our work is to try to protect, preserve, and in some cases, um, rewild and restore the functionality of these massive carbon storages before we come into a harmful time of climate change. This is another view of how they look like. This is from a place called Hanhi Aapa in Arctic Finland in time, time of September, colorful um, time of the year, just before the winter sets in. And here you can see a dispersal of some of the birch trees and then mixed with open peatland ecosystem. And again, uh, in science, the, a lot of these regions are known as sea, SIs, which means carbon stabilization areas, and also high biodiversity areas. One of the things to understand, and I know that you are located also in the northern part of the lower 48 and the US, is that a lot of the uh, migratory birds will come to the Arctic, into the, specifically into the peatlands, in the summer, in their millions, to nest, to have their young and uh, enjoy the abundance of insect life here. So whenever we are working on peatlands and restoring them in the Arctic, we are also alleviating and helping biodiversity, birds, uh, mammals, pollinators in the fight against climate change. But we have to know exactly what's going on. And that's why we, is no change, work with science. I will spend most of today or the second half of today talking to you about indigenous, uh, indigenous knowledge. But I just wanted to highlight <clears throat> with this slide that we are using something called trace gas analyzers that you can see there on the uh, photo with my colleague Antoine. And we are measuring, earlier I was talking about how, how the peatlands can be seen as the lungs of the world or at least the north. So here my colleague is measuring the intake and outflow of uh, greenhouse gases on our rewilding work. So we are using this very fancy and latest science available to try to come to a place of understanding how effective our actions are, how much in terms of quantifying are we uh, going on with this uh, work. And uh, the, the um, <clears throat> and I can see from Donna there is a question, but I will come, come to this. Uh, uh, maybe after my uh, quick round of uh, slides. So rest assured, I will answer Donna. 
Well, let's then go to the um, um, <clears throat> indigenous peoples, our linguistic cousins, the Sami people. Let's stop here for a moment. All of you may know that the, uh, in Christmas time, we talk about Rudolf and the reindeer. Well, here, here he is. He, don't, he doesn't have a red nose, but this is an actual Sami reindeer. <laughs> I'm not here to convince you if Santa Claus exists, but at least the um, reindeer are real. And of course, reindeer, which are kind of keystone, cultural keystone species with the indigenous peoples, the Sami, um, need healthy ecosystems and they need the time and space as a northern animal to adapt to the changes which are underway. As a secret, I can also tell you that sometimes we eat the reindeer, but let's not tell Rudolf that, that story. <clears throat> Now I want to introduce you again to my colleague, uh, Sami elder and knowledge holder, Vladimir Fyodorov. And uh, as I said, he, he sends all of the best of greetings to you and he's very sorry he can't be meeting you, with you. But uh, this is a photo of him fishing in his home area and uh, that's a crailing the fish that's he, that he's holding. And I will now tell you in context some of the points and work that we have done with Vladimir and the Sami uh, in rewilding and indigenous knowledge um, to try to come to terms with the Arctic climate change. So um, a few minutes ago, I was showing you how, how the scientific understanding of climate change, for example, on peatlands and the monitoring of greenhouse gases and other, of course, biodiversity and other assessments are needed. But there's another side to the story. Nowadays in the Arctic, we are <clears throat> working very closely with the traditional owners, the indigenous peoples. In your home area, uh, I would believe that around the Great Lakes, you have many First Nations or indigenous Native American peoples, including the Anishinaabe, and, and some of the Sioux people further west, and of course others too. So in this photo, you can see how indigenous knowledge holders, Teijo on the right-hand side, and uh, Jouko, and don't look at the smoking action, that's of course uh, not appropriate, but uh, nevertheless, um, are putting winter fishing nets to a specific location in the Sami home area to monitor how fish stocks are doing and how the ice conditions are on that specific time of the year. You can see how there's a special tool called Tura in the center of the photo here. And that's an ice pick that they can use very fast to go through even a couple of feet of ice. And um, there is a lot of literature and discussions around indigenous knowledge in the Arctic. I will just tell you that in, in many ways, um, it starts from the same place as science in terms of uh, making uh, direct and op um, sharp observations about nature, living with ecosystems and deducting or thinking what's going on based on the observations and experience. However, indigenous peoples around the world are, are the traditional owners of their home area. They are often seen to keep and maintain wisdom traditions, extremely close um, and uh, sensitive engagement with their ecosystems. For example, the Sami people have uh, in their languages names for reindeer and the salmon fish species that do not correspond with the current scientific understanding. They have more than the scientific uh, analytical view on species would tell us. And that's why <clears throat> indigenous knowledge is not only data, okay? It's not only a resource for things that are needed for science. It's a living culture. It's a living engagement with the home areas. And of course, unfortunately, because of the colonization and historical context, many indigenous peoples are not able to exercise all of their rights and ways of life. But at least the Sami still as a remote northern peoples are able to exercise some of their traditional 
food security, livelihoods, and, and their cultural activities. And then if they have a consented and, and uh, felt that this is something good, we have then collaborated with those communities to come to a place where both ways of knowing uh, science and indigenous knowledge are informing what's going on. I have only a couple of more slides, but I and and uh, I will just explain some of the work that Vladimir has left. Uh, uh, sorry, has led. And now I will take you on a very quick tour of the river Nätämä. You don't have to uh, pronounce that, but that's that's how it's called or spelled in Finnish. And you can see the landscape on the lower right hand corner of how the river looks like and on those those uppermost maps here, you can see the positioning of the river system between Sweden, Finland and Russia. So what's the context? Why are we showing you this work in trying to fight against climate change and preserve these unique natural and cultural systems? Well, one of the things to understand is that in the Arctic, you still have most of the, or in many cases, uh, very pristine ecosystems. Nathan, for the most part, is such a system. Secondly, it's the home of the Atlantic salmon. Salmon is a, another critically important uh, species to the Sami, and it's also central to biodiversity and, and uh, things like that. Um, the um, <clears throat> um, but climate change has been hit hitting this river system heavily, and it has also been affected by 1970s, about 50 years ago, um, from man-made changes, mainly for logging and some of the land use that was not too much, but in 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 unfortunately damaging ways practiced in this part of the world. And here we have, with, together with Vladimir and, he, and his team, we have started to implement the rewilding and restoration of these um, sites in order to buy time, resilience, and spatial, shall we say, or place-based solutions to warming water temperatures, and especially those fish like the salmon, like the trout, and uh, <clears throat> uh, crailing that are now suffering from the new extremely hot weather temperatures. And this is a quote from the indigenous Sami elder Vladimir that he wanted me to tell you today. That's myself and uh, him restoring a part of the river system. So I will just read this out for, for you and uh, let's, let's try to uh, reflect on that perhaps in the Q&A. So as he says, you cannot muck around on the river. The uh, river Nathama used to be sacred, holy for the Sami people before. And if you get fish, if you get a salmon or any other fish, you have to thank her. Um, uh, and uh, here what Vladimir is saying is that the Sami are thinking about the river as a person. In fact, as a uh, mother almost. The second part of the quote says that uh, Vladimir's grandmother, who was born in late 1800s, used to say that uh, uh, salmon is central to the Sami. Grandmother was saying that if salmon ceases to exist, the Sami are no longer human beings. And this is a point that uh, is extremely important to remember with indigenous peoples. They are connected in their ecosystems and with the species, the non-human species in many ways, uh, that's taking a long time, humbleness and respect to try to understand. And we are, as I said before, we are only now starting to discover the uh, immense connections that indigenous peoples and their home areas have had in the past. So the purpose of this quote that Vladimir wants to tell you today is to always respect nature. Never think that it's an empty space or some kind of a trifle thing. And in his world, he's trying to say that the river used to be sacred. And of course, to him, it's still sacred. Um, and the salmon and the Sami are very closely related. And uh, 
before I show you the last slide, that that's a work that we were doing. In, in fact, in this photo, we are restoring the hydrological conditions of that stream. Um, and you can see also the restored spawning areas, gravel and so on and so on. But the main point is that he led for five years the restoration of this part of the Natama Basin. So now we come to the end of the uh, first uh, uh, deck of slides and, and uh, the final question that, I, or let's put it this way, the final thing that I want to show you today with Vladimir, now that you have perhaps had some time to think about that quote he, he wanted to give you, is this one. In autumn 2021, the salmon-related trout have returned to Vainosjoki, that's the restored part of the river system, um, in full. They have a new home, or shall we say, a restored home, and in this underwater photo from last October that our team was able to capture, you can see how the trout and of course some of the other salmonid species are now enjoying a fully restored and uh, healthy part of the river using indigenous knowledge and science hand in hand, uh, the two ways of knowing, but first and foremost, um, building on the, on the wisdom of Vladimir and other elders like him to come to a place of understanding of the priorities and the things we need to do in the North and of course around the world. Uh, right now, for your futures, I'm, I'm already um, past my date of um, best usage and <laughs> Vladimir is over 70, but it's for you, all of the youth of today that we do this work. And uh, <clears throat> um, now I'm uh, stopping this sharing and I hope that we can have a quick or conversation about these topics and, and uh, I will answer all questions. Thank you very much. So, Okay, uh, shall we proceed to the questions straight away or, or is that a good idea? Uh, yeah, we can totally start with questions. Would you like us to read them? No, <clears throat> that's okay. I, I can, uh, I'll just look at the open questions and I'll try to um, respond to all of them. Right. So let's, uh, sorry. I just said, all right. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. So the first question comes from Donna and she says, uh, in what ways have peatland ecosystems been affected by global climate change? Has biodiversity in the peatland ecosystems adapted to the increasing temperatures? This is a, thank you, Donna. This is an extremely important and timely question. Um, the short answer is that yes, in the Arctic, especially we are witnessing, as you may recall, uh, from last year, a lot of the world talks, talks about the necessity of keeping to 1.5 degrees Celsius as a climate target. Well, I'm sorry to report to you, but in places like, like Alaska and Finland and Canada and Siberia, we are now starting to witness four to six degrees Celsius uh, increases very fast. So the Arctic is a place that's currently being impacted heavily. Now, Peatland ecosystems are also suffering from drought. You may know that peatlands are very uh, wet in their natural state. And now that we get drought in the summer or heavy, heavy uh, sunlight 24 hours a day, as you may recall in the Arctic, the sun doesn't set, set at all between May and uh, end of July. We are witnessing a shift in peatland ecosystems from more wet in, in different places into um, often more dry. And that will then impact the capacity of how much they are storing carbon, for example. And in some places in the Arctic, they can switch from um, sink to source. So if the warming continues very fast, we are witnessing an, the unfortunate event of uh, uh, getting these carbon storages to start to release carbon dioxide. Uh, biodiversity is trying to adapt. <coughs> I would say that the Arctic birds, for example, which are utilizing these peatlands are still doing all right. 
the worst hit areas are in Siberia and Arctic Alaska, because in those parts, peatland ecosystems are trapped in the permafrost, or there is per permafrost permanently frozen ground. And we are now seeing um, uh, expansion of uh, warming of permafrost. For example, in Alaska, in the US North, um, one of the unique things that has happened is that beavers have started to repopulate the high Arctic and expanding further north, which is of course a forest species. And, and uh, it, it's showing that the northern latitudes and peatlands are quite much um, changing. Let's go then to the second question, how many languages do, and you can come back to this, but I will just clear some of these points away. Um, how many languages do you speak to be able to interact with indigenous peoples? I speak six languages and I can operate um, in Finnish, a little bit of the Sami, in Russian, Swedish, and of course, English in the um, North American Arctic, where I have also um, worked. Then what kind of machinery do you guys use to uh, revitalize these ecosystems? Well, that's a very timely question because uh, in, in some parts of the Finnish uh, villages, we are using caterpillars and big machinery if the degradation of peatland has been by, from human use, has been, for example, peat mining has affected these sites heavily. And the areas are quite big, like the ones that I showed you from aerial photographs, you, you can see see that these are hundreds and hundreds of acres. And if you try to nurture them back into uh, uh, health, you need to use sometimes at the start, some heavy machinery. However, the, the um, photos that I showed you on the Trout River with Vladimir, that's one of the ways that indigenous peoples decided that we will only do everything by hand. They didn't want to use any machines. So you can imagine it was heavy and, <laughs> and um, long hours to restore the whole river system by hand. Let's go to the next one. How does reindeer taste like? Um, well, those of you who have ever tasted moose, it's a little bit uh, uh, like that. It's a um, very good meat, it's wild game meat, and you can compare, for example, with deer in some ways, um, the, the um, um, taste, but of course I invite you to try it and, and uh, if you could hunt the caribou, that, that's the same animal, uh, I would advise you to do that, but unfortunately the woodland caribou around Lake Great Lakes is so low in numbers that don't, don't go, boys and girls don't go out and hunt that now, otherwise I, I'll, I'll get the feedback on that. Uh, that was a stupid joke, but anyways, uh, what unique creatures have you interacted while restoring ecosystems? Um, well, one of the really important and great animals we have here in Finland in the forests is flying squirrel. I don't know how many people have uh, seen or witnessed a flying squirrel, but uh, please find out what's going on. And that's a pretty unique uh, squirrel that's, that's uh, able to glide between trees. And of course, then when I think of our um, large, um, for example, predators like wolverine or lynx, they are extremely beautiful wild animals. And if you go to Minnesota, you are able in the northern parts of the state in Minnesota, there is a boundary waters wilderness area. I have actually worked there in my youth. You will see there the timber wolves that are still in the US. So wolf, for example, is a very beautiful and amazing um, uh, <clears throat> animal. Uh, why are reindeer keystone species? Well, in these parts of the world, the reindeer and the Sami in this case have, and also there are some Finnish reindeer herders, um, they have tried to find a way to survive. Let's pause there for a moment in the traditional times. So think about that, if it's minus 40 and you don't have the cell phone, you don't have the warm house or the car, how do you survive? And that's why in the historical context, Sami people and the reindeer formed kind of an alliance 
the reindeer were semi-domesticated, for the lack of a better term, and they had a nomadic lifestyle. So they would be moving in, in the wintertime at the tree line and camping there, establishing their land use and occupancy, and then moving in the spring and summer to the good pasture areas of um, uh, Arctic Ocean. And that was the way how the reindeer gave life to the Sami. The meat, all of the clothing was made from the reindeer. And also, of course, it's a very special cultural bond between the animal and the indigenous peoples. And uh, <clears throat> I invite you to, for example, look on YouTube, some of the videos that talk about reindeer herding and the way of life. In North America, you don't have that reindeer herding, but you have the Inuit people, the Inupiaq people in Alaska, Athabascan groups, and some of the other Native Americans. In your part of the continent, think about the bison and some of the tribes in the lower 48 that were able to uh, form the same kind of keystone species relations before the ecosystems were altered about 150 years ago. What's your favorite memory from interacting with the ecosystems is the next question. Well, I'll be short and I'll tell you something. Um, in my own village, we had a peat mining or peatland that was heavily utilized and destroyed. And uh, I worked for 10 years to bring it back into health and rewild and restore it. And before we started the work in 2011, there was two bird species, a raven and black crows that were using the uh, peatland. Today, it's the home of 195 bird species. And uh, it, it's doing, it's actually one of the most important bird habitats in Finland at the moment. And it was an October evening about perhaps five years ago when I was on that site and the sun was going down and I was looking at the uh, landscape and suddenly I heard a noise and I could see tens of thousands of Arctic geese that were on their way to the southern latitudes on their migratory pathway and they started to come in and land on our peatland that we had restored and within half an hour we had 20,000 geese um, overnighting and spending the, the time on, on this restored ecosystem. And uh, it was from almost like a film where you can see a large quantity of birds. And I felt on that moment that uh, uh, we have done something right. Nature is somehow accepting the work that we do, building on traditional knowledge and science. So that, that's a fond memory that I don't, tell often, but I wanted to tell it here because it's a good question and thank you for that question. Okay, Ayush is asking, have you saved any endangered creatures as well? Uh, well, I would, the photo that I showed you at the end, the, the natural trout and the salmon and the habitats we are working on to save them is a good example of species that are doing very poorly and because of our work in that river system, they are doing better than uh, than before. And one of the things to understand here, that's also a good question, is that uh, please take a stop, uh, stop for a moment and think about the cold and the north and the Arctic. All of these animals and the species that you have seen and you, you could see in Alaska, for example, or even in the Great Lakes area in the wintertime, they have adapted. They have tried to find a way to survive in that ecosystem for thousands of years. And now that things are very quickly shifting and it's becoming more warm, um, they are in trouble. And that's why we can say that climate change is affecting also biodiversity and these endangered and uh, endemic animals. So Donna comes back and says, are there groups and activities that descendants of indigenous peoples um, uh, can join to aid in the conservation of native land. We are in the US. Um, yes, the short answer is yes. And one of the things to do is to try to, of course, if, if you want to make a difference to, to uh, work with indigenous peoples and Native Americans, um, you could try to find out what is the closest, uh, for example, reservation or native reserve close to you, or perhaps you, you have friends or some connections 
what one group that comes to mind, which is not too far away from your area, I believe, is uh, the uh, Honor the Earth Foundation and White Earth Reservation of the Anishinaabe people. They would be in Minnesota. And they have been running, if you Google them, um, Honor the Earth, led by Wynonna Laduk. Uh, they have been doing a lot of restoration work uh, with the tribes all across the continent. And also, I think Nature Conservancy is another organization in the US, US that's working with indigenous peoples um, to advance their rights and uh, restoration and conservation of na so-called native land. Then we have one from Bridget. Bridget. Here in the US, people are, sorry, it's jumping a little bit. People are much more connected to the environment than are others. How would you encourage others to become more connected to Earth? Well, yeah, I get this sometimes as a question um, in, um, in, in trying to think what does an ordinary person living in, for example, in suburbia or or in a house in, in, a, in, in a city can do. I have always tried to say that um, the best way of doing anything is to understand nature. And nature is everywhere. It's also in your house. You will have some birds around you. You will have the crown squirrel or uh, perhaps even some, some of the mammals or um, whatever the case. Try to learn about them. Do you know all the tree species that are growing around your uh, home environments? Do you know what the bird, bird <coughs> species are doing in different times of the year? Can you name the fish that are in your closest lake or um, uh, river system? How are they doing? What happens through the year with them? So the answer here that I try to encourage everybody to think about is that how do we for the lack of better term, reconnect our mind and skills and knowledge to that nature that we are living in. We don't have to go to Yellowstone or big parks to find the big solution. It's actually, and here comes the secret. It's actually right there for you, um, no, no matter how urbanized it has become. There are still pockets and uh, links to the living nature. And it's more in your mind than in the actual um, <clears throat> place where you are the solution will lie. And then we can start to rewild, restore, and think about the things we can do. Um, of course, I could give you the usual shopping list of uh, uh, recycling and don't, don't, don't drive a car and so on. But I try to encourage people to think about the birds. And for example, how are they doing through the year? Do you know them? Do you know their behavior? Maybe you have binoculars and you can try to observe uh, what's going on in the bird life, in the insect life. And what I'm trying to say is that always um, decolonize and, and uh, work with your own skills, your own mind. And there you will find a lot of solutions that will come to you. Uh, what's the next one is, what's your favorite place where you have ever been? Um, well, I live in a small village here in Finland in the forest. Uh, so this is, of course, my home. But I also have always enjoyed uh, northern Minnesota and uh, Boreal Canada. So, as I said earlier, the Great Lakes region is a, really having a special place in my heart for, for many reasons, including the Anishinaabe culture, that's the First Nation or, or Native Americans there. And uh, the, the um, <clears throat> I would encourage people, if they have the time, to go canoeing, for example, in the Boundary Waters. Uh, which is in northern Minnesota, or just in your home area. Learn wilderness skills. Go out, do, throw the iPhone out, and uh, or use it just for exactly the smallest things uh, needed, and try to always go out and uh, into the outdoor environments. And that's how you start to get connected. <clears throat> On the topic of Great Lakes, I would like to recommend a book called uh, um, Death and Life of Great Lakes. It will summarize the Lake Superior and other lakes really well and gives you lots of knowledge if people want to uh, study that. Donna comes back again saying, are there books or documentaries you recommend about conservation and indigenous peoples? Well, I'll be very short here. 
I would actually recommend if people want to see good films and and uh, well-made um, documentaries about indigenous peoples, of course they are on YouTube, so you can always Google that. But if you want to look into historical context and today's films that are really uh, respectful and some of them have been made by the indigenous peoples, you could go to National <clears throat> Film Board of Canada website. Uh, that's nfb.ca. And it's a wonderful place of um, documentaries and films about the North and North America, about indigenous peoples, conservation, even the Great Lakes and, and uh, some of these uh, areas north of you. And uh, that, that's a little bit of advertising on a public website that you could go to. So nfb.ca. And, and you have everything going on there. Okay, so next one is the, uh, <clears throat> what's your favorite animal you have ever worked with? I would probably say uh, northern pike. That's a fish species that's also with you and it's really close to our uh, culture, the Finnish culture, and uh, I, I really uh, respect and admire that, la uh, that lake fish. That's that's still doing rather well, but it's a it's a mm, almost like crocodile of the north, <laughs> and uh, it's a really great fish. So I like to support actions that favor northern pike. Next one: What can people do to support indigenous people more, and especially with conservation efforts? Yeah, <clears throat> well, now we come to a flashpoint here, and uh, we know also in Finland that the time in the world is very divisive. We have families and people thinking very uh, against each other, and it's very, very uh, hard to find a place, place of calm thinking and uh, good thoughts. And if you think about the indigenous peoples, they were run over, they were violently taken over and uh, massacred in the historical context. And that's why the, the, um, any work with indigenous peoples is always a story of a uh, lot of grief, a lot of equity and justice questions, and the lingering existing um, problems with indigenous rights and um, so on and so on. So again, I would encourage you to think, can you link up with, for example, Honor the Earth or some of the indigenous organizations in your state? Um, you are always welcome to contact us at Snow Change and we can put you forwards to connections. But before you do that, learn about the indigenous peoples, learn about what happened. Okay, why are we here in 2022? And how does it look like this? Why does it look like this? What happened in 1890s? What's wounded knee, for example, in the US history and things like that? We don't have time to go into all of the details, but I encourage the young people always to think about the historical reason why we are in today's world, because you are the ones that will inherit all of this. And it's then dependent on your skills to know the history that we understand the future. That was a little bit of a historical context. Bridget comes back and says, uh, how large is the indigenous peoples in Finland compared to others? Um, and uh, is, the, is it a large group or just a small number of people trying to rewild? The Sami indigenous peoples number about 8,000 in Finland. That depends a little bit on identification. And overall, the population of Finland is 5 million. The answer to your second part of the question is that the Sami, the elder Vladimir and others like him are, of course, concerned about their home area, the indigenous home area they are living in. But it's also us Finnish people that are concerned about nature, and it's a growing group. It's not still over 50% of Finland or something, but I would say that uh, in Finland we are of course witnessing impacts of climate change, and rewilding is one of the uh, mechanisms we can try to do fast and in a, um, uh, shall we say, coherent way to try to restore, as I was talking about the uh, peatland that we restored and the geese came back and that was really important to my village for example. How is it helpful to speak multiple languages for all of the studies you are doing? Well 
<clears throat> as I showed you the map earlier about the finno ukric languages, um, each language is a kind of a unique way of looking at the world. It's not all in English available. For example, as I said, or let me put it this way, the Anishinaabe people, the indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes area, they have um, many, many dozens of words for different wild rice, fish species, the, the uh, mammals and so on and so on. So we need this planet not only to be biodiverse, it also has to be culturally diverse. All the, all the uh, groups are needed. Nobody is wrong. It's not wrong to be from indigenous peoples. It's not wrong to be Afro-American or uh, have roots in China or in Finland. We are all needed, but we have to maintain our own cultures. That's what cultural diversity and linguistic diversity is all, all about. And uh, finally, I would say that uh, indigenous languages are often so well connected with their home area that uh, it's very beautiful and uh, extremely closely able to describe the living conditions, the ecosystems, poetry, oral histories. And for example, I'll end with a, uh, something that you may have not known. Many indigenous peoples have their own words for the stars and the star constellations. And they are very different from our understanding of the Big Dipper and so on and so on. Brittany comes back or says that the, in the US right now, wolves are being hunted heavily in certain states. You have a, the same problem where you are. What do you do to help to fight them or that issue? Yes, we have the same question. And this, this is un, the unfortunate case of uh, uh, misunderstanding of the role of wolf in boreal ecosystems. Wolves belong into nature. And if they cause trouble, if they come too close to houses, there are mechanisms for, to uh, try to alleviate those uh, difficulties without killing the animal. So wolf hunting is a complex uh, issue and you should always work with the local ranchers, local conservation people to find solutions uh, however, wolf belongs in nature. It's not the enemy, and it has not eaten a person in a uh, God knows how many decades. So it's us that are encroaching on the wolf populations and their territory, not vice versa. Then Jennifer says, uh, <clears throat> you said the river has been changed by man in 1970s. If someone can't return to the place where they hatched because they run into an obstacle, do they get as close as they can and then spawn or do they exhaust themselves? That's a brilliant question and thank you, Jennifer. I'm so sorry that we don't have all the time in the world, but that's smack on. And one of the rewilding things we have done is to remove those um, alterations and enable salmon and trout to come back into their spawning areas which we also have uh, rewilded because some of those locations were lost in the work. So I encourage Jennifer Yu to become a salmon scientist and work with us or in the US, uh, some of the salmon habitats, uh, you are really thinking well and uh, I can see potential there for uh, thinking about these questions uh, well. Next question is, uh, <clears throat> How many Arctic animals such as narwhals, walrus, snowy owl, Arctic fox have been affected by climate change? What actions can we take lo locally to help uh, river cleanup, planting native trees? And, uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, yes, well, if you want to find the numbers and a good scientific study on how the Arctic animals are doing, it's a bit science heavy but you can go to arcticbiodiversity.is. I'll, I'll say that again, arcticbiodiversity.is. That's a big scientific study we did over a decade on looking at all of these species, narwhals, walrus, snowy owl, arctic fox, and so on. And the short answer is that all of them are affected. Probably the least one of these on your list is the, uh, sorry, the narwhal. Um, they are still quite abundant in the Canadian North and Canadian Arctic, but walrus has lost a lot of the extremely important sea ice that they have to haul into to rest and, and uh, uh, in the cycles between feeding. Snowy owl is very hard to um, assess because they are so migratory. We 
in Finland get some of the birds that are have been in Alaska. So it, the snowy owl is something that moves really lo- over large areas. And uh, we know that it's doing poorly, especially in Alaska, but it's very hard to assess how bad things are. But Arctic fox is doing really poorly here. And that's a classical example of probably climate change being one of the big drivers. Um, Red fox, the boreal fox, is replacing a lot of the Arctic fox habitats in Finland in the Arctic. And um, it's a clear indication that we might lose the Arctic fox here, not in the North American North yet. But that's heavily um, impacted by the the, uh, climate things in many ways. What can we do locally to help? you have a very good list, start with that. One of the things you can do to alleviate the Arctic is that please understand a lot of the migratory birds that come into the north in the summer will come to you or even further south in the the autumn and winter. And more we have healthy habitat, more we have restored lands, we can try to do something and each little bit helps. It's not wrong to do small things like a, a clean a river or a small stream, as long as you know what you are doing. So never do anything if you are uncertain. Ask your professor, ask your friend, go to the NGO or go to a local official and ask, what can I do? How can I chip in and, and uh, spread the message? The fight we are in is now. These will be the years, the decisive moments when the planet will go this way or the wrong way. And that's why you are in the front line no matter where you are. And you will also be the caretakers in the future of this planet. So we still have a fighting chance. And there's a lot of things we can do despite the dark hour. And that's why I encourage whoever posted this uh, question to not to surrender, not to feel bad. Don't believe all the bad things that come your way. There are still things that each one of us can do, as I have tried to show you with Vladimir and myself working in this part of the world. And I challenge all of you to do the same back home. Okay, let's look at the two remaining ones. And please, you can still post if you want. How has COVID affected your village? Um, Thank you for asking. Um, All of our transport and uh, public events, of course, has been down for two years. And and, uh, um, but here, living in the north in a small village of 300 people, we are of course uh, in in easier position than the big cities. Even though the catastrophic impacts are everywhere, we have lost some of the old people. Veikko Siltala, for example, he was 83 extremely close friend of mine and and an elder, and he died a year ago. So we are all affected all over the world. And and, uh, um, we we have to think about this and then rebuild when the time comes. And hopefully it's this spring, at least we are seeing the end of the restrictions in many ways. And then Jay comes back and says, how do you exactly reworld, I would say rewild, perhaps that's what Jay is asking. That's also a good question because I have been to- telling you about details, landscapes, people, indigenous peoples, but what is rewilding actually doing? I'll, I'll say in a short frame that um, rewilding, sometimes it's u- used also in the context of restoration, but rewilding tries to restart natural features of a landscape on nature's own terms. So think about your front lawn if you are living in a house and your mother or your parents or somebody is telling you you need to cut cut down the lawn every day or every week in the summertime and so on. Rewilding could be taken in that spot by allowing the grasses to grow, the insects to come back, the pollinators, maybe the hedgehog or the skunk or the um, whatever creatures are living in your world and in your home. Uh, they would have a fighting chance on their own terms. So rewilding work in in a nutshell tries to restart and enable natural functions of ecosystems on the, on the uh, shall we say, conditions as nature sees fit and with minimum human intervention after the start. As I said, sometimes we have to restart the functions, but then we let go 
and let nature have her way. So uh, thank you for pretty amazing questions. We had from salmon restoration to uh, what can we do in a local context and so on and so on. I'm still open for any final questions, but otherwise uh, let me in closing thank all of you for the interest. I don't know how many people were actually listening, but uh, I hope that you learned at least something about the Sami and Finnish landscapes. And I pity you all the well on top of the hour. Thank you. Kidding, never mind. All right, I think that's it. Thank you so much for coming in and speaking with us. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.